when they get a shoe box, they feel so happy. When you are distributing the box, you give a box with a greatest gift. A physical gift with the most amazing gift they could ever receive, the gospel message, salvation. It's just an amazing combination of God's love. It's not just a shoebox filled with toys. It is really a space where conversation can happen, where someone can introduce them to Jesus and let them know, hey, God sees you, God loves you. We partner with local churches that are seeking to advance the gospel, and that's what I'm seeing here today. God's plan A for the Great Commission is the local church. And to partner with an organization that's making the local church the priority, empowering them to go make disciples, I can't think of a, a better investment for the gospel. Operation Christmas Child gives every person from the child to the senior adult the opportunity to get engaged in a mission project. It's the hands and feet of Jesus. I'm telling you, it touches lives. When we started packing these boxes, they pushed us to an international level. We have called to touch all of the world. The program Operation Christmas Child is a way in which we have been able to get to the villages where we could not have been able to get to. I think that all those who are currently packing boxes around the world are getting to the confines of the earth. And so I encourage people to just take a step, pack a shoebox, and really just see what God will do. Good morning. What a great way to be the hands and feet of Jesus with the Operation Shoebox Christmas time. And I know Brother John will speak more to that in just a minute. But let's all get started. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Lloyd. Please stand as we open with Days of Elijah. Good morning, and again, we welcome you here to First Baptist Church of Lloyd. Just want to go over a few things first uh, with you. Of course, shoe boxes. So again, the point is you take a box, and you go, and you fill it. 
So if you want to fill up the whole box and get all the goodies that, that go in a box, you know, the, the toiletry items, the toys, those types of things, make sure you check out the list because it tells you what can be included and what not to include. And first time you do it, it's always uh, easy to, to put the things in there that you, you're not supposed to bring. But we'll do a check here because we'll have a packing party. Every box will be double checked. Make sure it's full. Here's one way a lot of people do it. They'll take two four, five, six of these boxes. And they'll say, you know what, I'm gonna take a set amount of money and I'm gonna buy one special gift for each box. And they'll go out and they'll just buy that one special gift. And then go ahead and bring it the back with just that one thing in it. Again, at the packing party, we will fill it up with all the little stuff. So again, sometimes that one special gift, and if you pray about it, it'll then get out there and get to that one special person that it needs to get to. Or again, you might want to fill up several of the boxes yourself, fill them up halfway. Again, sometimes you can't find the exact thing you're looking for. Fill, fill up two or three boxes halfway, take just one box, fill it up all the way, however you want to participate. Or again, I've told you, if you're a Costco Sam shopper and you like that kind of shopping, then buy those multi-packs of all those different things and then just donate that. And then that way then we'll have plenty of things for the packing party. So I love finding the, the, the Matchbox cars where there's six of them in the thing. So that's, you know, six different boxes that are gonna get an awesome Matchbox car and that type of thing. So again, those are the types of ideas, ways you can be involved in that. And you see that through these videos, you'll see how it goes out and is used by the missionaries. Again, when you're at the warehouse packing and stuff, they say, oh, for the next hour, you're going to see boxes come through with no markings and no outward signs of where this is coming from. These are those countries that we've been able to work deals with that we can get this in there. But it may be a country where, again, sharing the gospel is against the law. But this is a way for a missionary to go in and say, hey, we have these gifts for the children. We want to give them. And then, of course, they share the good news with the children as they, they give them those gifts. So, again, those are the types of things that, that these are used for, and you are a bigger part of the body of Christ working in this world today. But working locally, we have several opportunities this week. On Thursday, it is the last Thursday of the month, so Brothers in Christ will be meeting in the Fellowship Hall, 6 p.m., uh, on Saturday, we will have the Celebration of Life service for Lawrence Parker. That's going to be here at 11 a.m. in the auditorium. There will be a meal following. We want it to be a fish fry, but, you know, finding fish at this time of the year is sometimes tricky. So there is chicken. There will be sides. If we do find that fish, we will have plenty of fish for you as well. Now, Lawrence Parker was that... that you know, uh, country gentlemen. So again, you come in your boots, you come in your jeans, you wear your hat and take it off at the right times and he will be honored on Saturday. So we want to join with the, the Bouthwell family uh, with celebrating his life. And then uh, again, remember the shoebox ministry. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, but let's have our scripture here first. Psalm 511. Uh, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. I hope you can fit one of those categories. I hope by the end you will be fitting all of those categories, that you will be rejoicing in God, you will be shouting for joy, and you will also love God as you leave here. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you. We praise you. You've brought us here on this Sunday with the beautiful weather turning, starting to hint at coolness. Lord, we've got some possible storms out there in the tropics that we know you have full control over. We give you this week, but more importantly, we give you this day, and we ask that your name be rejoiced through this day by our songs, by our words, and by, by what we hear. We thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand seeing where the Spirit of the Lord is.
Good morning, everybody. I, um, I promised Hughes that I would tell this um, joke that he told us on the way home the other day. Uh, we were driving home, and he goes, Mom and Dad, I think I know why they call Jesus Jesus. And so we said, what was that, buddy? And he goes, well, everybody saw all the miracles he was doing, and they go, oh, geez, us. <laughs> Now you can go to children's church, buddy. (laughs) But before we get started, I wanted to share praise with you guys. So a few weeks ago, um, if you remember, I came down here and I got some dust in my eyes and I, you know, all that. Um, And I asked the church for prayer because we were going through some tough times. Well, I wanted to give you all a praise and, and an update. It's been, I guess, about four weeks now where... It's, Shaughnessy has been doing very, very well, and the, the, the prayer that we received and the, the love that we've received from everybody has just been tremendous, and we wouldn't have been able to get through that and get to the place we're at without you guys, and, and there's just not enough thanks we can give y'all for that. Um, now, I want to start us off with a story um, this morning. It's... It's an urban legend of Jesus and his disciples. So one morning, Jesus and his disciples got up, and Jesus asked the disciples, I want you to pick up and carry a stone for me. So the disciples went out, and they gathered stones. Well, Peter, um, being the smart man he was, he picked up a small pebble and put it in his pocket. The disciples were, they were going to walk to the next town, which was a day's walk away. So they walk about half a day, and they stop for lunch. And the disciples ask Jesus, what, what are they going to do for lunch? And Jesus says, well, w- take your stones out. And he turns their stones into bread. Well, you can imagine Peter's disappointment when he pulls his tic-tac-sized piece of bread out of his pocket. And that's all he has for lunch. So they eat lunch. And Jesus again says, pick up a stone and carry it for me. Well, Peter, being the smart man he is, he picks up a giant rock to carry. So they continue on for the rest of the day. They get to the river where they were going, and um, they stop, and they're all wondering what they're going to have for dinner. Well, Jesus, then Peter's looking forward to his giant loaf of bread he's about to get. Well, Jesus says, I want you to throw your stones in the river. So Peter first picked up the small rock because it was easy. Then he picked up the big rock because he thought he was going to get a big reward at the end. So there's two different sides of this story that I want to talk about, and one is being a passive Christian. Passivity is a characteristic of somebody who holds back and lets others act. To be passive is to abstain from resistance and yield to external influences. So do we pick up the small rock? We're going to talk about that one first. Do we pick up the small stone? Are we believers that do the bare minimum? We come to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. We mind our own business. We come, sit, listen, um, and then we leave. This is not being an active member of the body of Christ. If we do not participate and follow what God has called us to do, then we are actively disobeying God. He has called each of us to do something special within the church. No matter how insignificant you think that role is, if God called you to do it, then it's a vital function of the entire body. It could be something as simple as replacing the toilet paper in the bathrooms. If that person stops replacing the toilet paper in the bathrooms, we're going to have some problems. If whoever it is that vacuums this beautiful sanctuary stops vacuuming the beautiful sanctuary, it's going to turn ugly pretty quickly. So no matter how insignificant you think your role that you're called to do is, it is very important and vital to the function of the entire church. 2 Timothy 4.7 says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Don't choose to be a spectator. We're called to be in the race. We're not supposed to be in the, in the stands. We're supposed to be participating in the race. Being passive is being lukewarm. I read a story about being lukewarm, and it goes like this. You have two sides and a fence down the middle. You have the believers on one side, 
then you have the non-believers on the other. Well, a man was neither a believer or an unbeliever. He was lukewarm, and he stood on the fence. Well, God came, and he gathered all the believers on his side of the fence, and the devil came, and he gathered all the non-believers on the other side of the fence and left the man in the middle. Well, soon after, the devil came back for the man that was on the fence, and the man goes, wait a minute, I was on neither side and the devil says, I know, but I own the fence. There's Revelation 3, 14, or 15 through 16 says, I know all things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. So being lukewarm is worse than being an unbeliever because if we claim to be Christians and do not stand out from the world because we've been transformed by God through Christ, then we will not win anybody over for God. And we risk turning people away for being hypocrites with no remorse. Why would somebody want to be a Christian when they could live their lives the way they want, the same as a lukewarm Christian? Our purpose is to show the world that what we have because of God and to help them realize they need what we have through God, not the other way around. There's no neutral ground when it comes to being a believer. You either are or you aren't. There's no middle ground. Do we choose to be Christians when it's easy and convenient for us? Do we pick up the small stone because it's easy and it doesn't, it, it doesn't affect our daily lives? How do we act and respond to the influences of the world outside of these walls? It's very easy to be a Christian among Christians. We live in a country, and not only a country, we live in in a county that is very easy to be a Christian among other Christians. It's easy not to not to curse in church. It's easy to be kind. It's easy to act the way we're supposed to within the comfort and safety of these walls. Do we produce the same fruit in our everyday lives that we produce here at church? How would we act if we live in a country where being a Christian was bad for your health? We have some people here that go to other countries, and we've listened to them on a Wednesday night talk about where being a Christian was not exactly good for you. Being caught with a Bible could put you in prison, send you to the salt mines. Being caught at having an underground church study could get you put in prison, or, or worse, even killed. So... We are very fortunate to live in a country where it is not bad for our health to be a Christian. The instructions throughout Scripture rarely call us to be passive. Obedience to God's commands often require us to leave our comfort zones and speak out, make a choice, and move toward the goal God set. Now, I, this is my third time being up here, and I hate public speaking. But yet, here I am, out of my comfort zone, up here sweating, y'all can't see, knocking my knees, but I'm up here regardless because we are often called to leave our comfort zones in order to fulfill God's will. The last instructions Jesus left for his disciples was this, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So now, do we pick up the large stone for our own gain? Are we Christians that are only active for selfish gain? Do we choose to help others only when there's an audience? Do we only do good so that we can elevate ourselves? Do we wait till someone is around before we drop our tithe in the box? Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name, and perform many miracles in your name. 
But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. So you may ask, how could someone who calls out to the Lord not make it into heaven? Well, there's one key word in that verse, and they said, look what we did. Instead of look what God did through us, they said, look what we did. Anything that we do should not start with the word I, it should start with Jesus. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, says, Do not be selfish, don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for our own interests, but take an interest in others too. We are to have the same mindset as Jesus. In Philippians it says, Though, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, he took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. When he appeared to be in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. We must learn to be others-focused, not self-focused. The motto we have on some of our shirts is joy, Jesus, others, and then you. And then you. If we put Jesus and others ahead of ourselves, then it will be very difficult to be prideful and self-centered with the things that we do. When we truly see how much Christ has done for us, our pride and selfishness melt away. Those who know the love of Christ don't wrangle for position within the family of God. Those who, we recognize the purpose God has for us within the body, and we fulfill it. They are willing to take a behind-the-scenes place in order to serve others. Peter tells us that God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Use your gifts to the best of the ability God gave you, and you'll watch him move mountains regardless of how small you think that role is. So when we understand the incredible sacrifice, grace, and mercy of God on our behalf, we realize that we have no use for pride. When we recognize God's abundance, grace, abundant grace, provision, and love, we understand that we have no need for selfishness. We need not focus solely on our own interests because we rest in our Savior. We need not focus, or we have not, we have been adopted into his eternal family, and we can learn to love that family as the Father loves us. Rather than be motivated by selfishness or pride, we can be of one mind with fellow believers and put their interests above our own. So what kind of Christian does God call us to be? Matthew five thirteen through 16 says, tells us this. We are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor, can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. It is the same way let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father so salt had two purposes in the middle east in the first century because of the lack of refrigeration salt was used to preserve food because meat would spoil very quickly in the desert climate so believers in christ are preservatives to the world preserving it from the evil that is running rampant second salt was used then and now as a flavor enhancer. Who likes to use salt on their food in here? I don't because my wife's cooking's pretty good, so I don't need the salt. <laughs> gotcha, Mr. Shaw. <laughs> um, in the same way that salt enhances the flavor of food at seasons, the followers of Christ stand out as those who enhance the flavor of life in this world. 
Christians living under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the obedience of Christ will inevitably influence the world for good as salt has a positive influence on the flavor of the food that it seasons. Where there is strife, we are the peacemakers. Where there is sorrow, we are the ministers of Christ, binding up wounds. And where there is hatred, we are to exemplify the love of God in Christ, returning good for evil. Luke 6.35 says, But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get back to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Now when it comes to being the light of the world, the concept is similar. We are to be the light in the darkness. And the only way to, to do this is to allow God to shine his light through us. In the beginning, in the beginning was the light God was the light of the world. In Genesis 1, 3, it said, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God was the light in the darkness in the beginning. He didn't create the sun until day four. So he was the light, and that is the light that we are supposed to shine in the world today, is God's glory and love. So how do we become the light in the darkness? We show the world God's love through our actions. We are called to do more than just have faith and be passive Christians. James tells us this. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save someone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give the person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is, deed, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish can you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Just simply believing there's a man named Jesus won't save you. The demons believe in Jesus. The devil believes in Jesus. That won't save you. If it won't save them, how can it save us if we, if we don't show our faith with good deeds we are to we are to produce fruit that is pleasing to god and what are these fruits lucky for us god knew that we were visual learners and he left it for us right here galatians 5 in galatians 5 22 and 23 it says but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace faithfulness kindness goodness gentleness and self-control Against such things, there is no law. So as Christians, we are called to be the salt and light of the world. If we choose to carry the small stone and be passive, or the large one to be our own selfish gain, then we will lose our flavor and our light. What good is salt without flavor? It's tossed in the road and trampled into dust. And what good is a candle without a wick? Don't choose to be com- what's comfortable. Don't choose selfishness. Choose to be the salt and the light that God called us to be. Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is in his good, pleasing, and perfect will allow yourselves to be transformed by god so that we can fulfill our purpose for our lives don't choose to be passive if you don't know what your purpose is in this church pray about it find ask all you have to ask do is ask and listen find your place in the body of christ there's plenty to be done around here i can promise you 
We have a handful of people that do quite a bit in this church, but there are many other tasks and places for everyone else to find. All you have to do is ask God what your, what your talent is. What are, what's, your, what are your, what's your skill set? Is it teaching children? Is it the nursery? Is it cooking on a Wednesday night? Is it playing the piano? Is it singing in the choir? No matter what, how big or how little that task is, it is important to the entire body of Christ. He wouldn't have given it to you if it wasn't important. I'll leave you with one more thought is when you leave here today and you're sitting in traffic and somebody in front of you isn't exactly driving the way you would like them to drive or you're at the grocery store and the person in front of you is having trouble checking out or finding their writing a check which still happens from time to time and you're sitting there tapping your foot thinking you're in a hurry rather than getting upset with what's inconvenienced you take the opportunity to show God's love in these instances at school at work in the grocery store there's opportunities everywhere if you open your eyes and look and God is God he wants you to share his love with everybody. That is our purpose, our sole purpose in this world is to show the world the light in the darkness, his light in the darkness. So um, I'll leave you with that. I would like to, um, again, thank everybody for their love for my family and what y'all have done for us. I can never repay you other than just praying for everybody and and I'm going to close this in prayer, and please come and pray and ask God where, where you're needed in the, in the body of Christ, and he'll show you. Dear Lord, thank you for the beautiful weather that you've sent us the last few days, Lord. The cool mornings sure have been nice, and the rain that you've been sending us, Lord. Thank you for those that were able to come this morning and, and listen to what you've shared through me, Lord. And please open up our hearts and our minds to do your will and to not be afraid to act and not be passive, Lord. And help us to not do things for the wrong reasons, to, for our own self-gain, Lord. Help us to, to be the Christian that you have called us to be, and help us to find the place in the body of Christ that you have called us to be in, Lord, so that the entirety can function like it's supposed to. Please keep us safe for this week with that storm. Uh, everybody's watching, Lord. Thank you for the rain that you've got coming our way again. And just keep us safe throughout this week. And, and thank you so much for everything you've done for us. In your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Don't forget, Wednesday night, sign up for dinner if you haven't already so they know, um, so they know how many to, to cook for and have enough food. Y'all have a wonderful Sunday and a great week, and we'll see you on Wednesday.